well. So welcome everyone. Uh, just an idea of what I am going to talk about today. Uh, this is just intended to be a short, fun overview about wild edible plants, a sampling of some fun recipes that you can make with things that are available right now at this time of year, and recommendations on other things that you can try on your own and resources to go to learn more. And I did include our website, the mnwcd.org slash planting for clean water. If you're interested in any of the other presentations that our office has given this spring, planting for pollinators, planting for wildlife, we've got presentations from last year about wetlands and prairies. You can go there to find resources and copies of those presentations as well. So just a little bit about myself. I coordinate the East Metro Water Resource Education Program. It's a local government partnership that has 25 members, and I'll tell you about who those people are in a moment. Um, but I am an outdoors gal at heart. So I love doing anything outdoors, whether it's running, biking, hiking, um, getting out there and exploring the prairies and the woods. And you saw my right hand man, the assistant, Charlie Hong, and he loves to get out there with me as well. So in putting together this presentation, we try to collect video footage wherever we could uh, to just give you a more realistic sense for where, you know, what things look like when you find them out in the field. And you'll just have to forgive us because this was me and an eight-year-old recording the videos. So they'll probably be extremely atrocious. Um, the Washington Conservation District is where my office is located. And if you're in Washington County, you might be familiar with our office. We're a countywide local unit of government. We've been in existence since 1942, so more than 75 years. And the uh, district was established right after the Great Depression, after the Dust Bowl, in a direct response to that environmental catastrophe and with the goal of working with farmers to prevent erosion that impacts the soil and the farms and prevent water pollution. And we continue to do that kind of work today, but we also work with homeowners, we work with businesses, we provide free site visits to anyone around the county, and we help to restore land and water resources. Um, in addition, I mentioned that there is a partnership uh, that Washington Conservation District is part of, and this East Metro Water Resource Education Program includes eight watershed management organizations that all have a portion of Washington County. There's a few of them, like um, the Comfort Lake Forest Lake Watershed actually extends up into Chisago County. Rice Creek goes into Ramsey, Anoka, and Hennepin. Ramsey, Washington goes a little ways into Ramsey. Um, but these different regions of the county are managed by smaller entities, watershed districts, which work to prevent flooding and protect water quality. So the cool thing about watershed districts is that most of them have cost share grants for projects like native gardens and rain gardens that help to protect water resources. And they also do larger capital improvement projects that you might hear about in your own area. They are actually located all around the Twin Cities area, but we only work with the ones that are here in Washington County. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the basic guidance before we start in on the fun stuff, which is all of the recipes. And um, the first thing that you might be thinking about when you're talking about wild edibles is where do I go to find plants that are outside that I could eat? And there's plenty of places that plants are growing that are edible, but they're not all ideal locations that you could or should be going to harvest if you're trying to find something to eat. Obviously, your own house is always okay. You know what's growing there, it's your own property, you have permission to harvest things there. Um, it is usually okay. I put um, city parks, county parks, nature centers, random public land. Every public space has a little bit different rules to it. And um, in my area, I live in Stillwater, and we have a lot of what I would call this random public land, where it's not really an actively managed city park. Uh, it might just be a big ravine, uh, it might be a trail corridor, someplace where they're not actively managing the land. And usually a place like that is a fine place that if you find some nettles growing or some dandelions or something else that you can harvest it without worrying that you're 
uh, taking plants out of a planted garden or taking something out of an area that's got herbicide being applied. Um, proceed with caution with places like schools and churches and other quasi-public spaces. A lot of times those places are using a lot of fertilizer and herbicide treatment on their lawns. So just because you see a field of dandelions doesn't necessarily mean it's a good place to harvest unless you're pretty sure that it is not being um, treated with chemicals. And then a lot of us think about these kinds of things when we're spending time outside, out in a state park or at a national park, we're camping. And unfortunately, those locations, it's usually not legal to harvest wild edible plants to eat. Um, in the state scientific and natural areas and national parks, it pretty much never is. In state parks, it's okay to harvest edible fruits and mushrooms while you're out hiking on a trail. You can pick some raspberries and you can eat them, but it's not okay to do something like harvest a big wad of um, watercress that you're gonna take home and make into a soup. So you can kind of nibble on your way if you're on a trail, but that's about all you're allowed to do in the state parks. Um, and then just a couple more tips that I wanted to share before we get into the recipes the what not to do. And I thought of six main categories of the what not to do. So just going in order kind of clockwise from the upper left hand corner, herbicides. So we use herbicides as a way to kill plants. And once an herbicide has been sprayed on the plant, the plant starts to absorb it. Therefore, you wouldn't want to eat uh, dandelion in an area where an herbicide has been applied because it's already absorbed that chemical in there. So that's why we try to be careful of where you're harvesting your wild edibles from. Um, the next one that I put in here is this just beautiful little wildflower that I found once on a friend's property in Western Wisconsin. It's a Carolina Spring Beauty and I've never seen them before. I had to look it up in a book just to find out what they are. So technically they're edible, but if you find something like that that's super rare, don't be a jerk and eat the only one that's in the woods. Maybe just leave that one as a special little surprise that somebody can find. Uh, so just because something's edible doesn't mean that you should eat it. We have a lot of private property in Minnesota and in Washington County. So do be cautious when you see posted private property. Don't just wander onto people's land because that's not okay. And a lot of times they'll be very upset about it. Uh, I included the picture of the mushrooms. Um, if you don't really know what a thing is and you kind of think it's edible, but you're not really sure if it's safe to eat, and you think maybe it's gonna be okay, to, you probably just shouldn't eat it. Um, I, in general, just don't harvest mushrooms. They're not a specialty of mine. I have like two species that I can positively identify. Uh, and I know, you know, like this is a picture of an Amanita mushroom. Theoretically, there's some way that you can prepare it that you wouldn't die from eating it, but it's kind of like a puffer fish. I'm just not going to take my chances not to do that. Um, I put in a picture of a cow here. Don't cow out. So say you find something, it's edible. It's one of your favorite things. That doesn't mean you should completely decimate the entire population of it. Take a little bit, maybe 10%, leave enough that there's plenty for um, the plant to be able to propagate itself for somebody else or maybe an animal to be able to look, come along and find it. Um, and then the last thing I put in is a picture of an algae slick of water, uh, because some of the things that I'll talk about today are found in streams or they're found along lakes and wetlands. And you should know if you are harvesting from a, you know, a clean stream or one that potentially has maybe E. coli contamination in it. If you go to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and look at their impaired waters viewer, you can find a map that shows all of the impaired lakes and streams around Minnesota. And that's a good way to know if some place where you are wanting to harvest plants might actually have contamination in the water that you can't see. Okay, so let's get right into it, right? The fun stuff, sample recipes and demonstrations. Um, let me just pause real quick. Lauren, are there any questions that are that are popping up before I keep talking here? Nope, none so far. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm gonna get into it then, and I'm gonna start with my favorite fun starter plant, especially at this time of year, the dandelions. They are just everywhere. You can find them everywhere, and this is one of those plants that people either love them or you hate them. Um, the funny thing about dandelions is that Puritans, when they moved to the United States 400 years ago, they actually intentionally brought dandelions here. 
because they are a plant that's been grown for centuries as a wild edible, not a wild edible, but a cultivated edible uh, for both medicine and for food. And they're a really rare plant in that all parts of them are edible. The roots, the stems, the leaves, the flowers, the seeds. They have tons of vitamins in them and obviously they're super easy to find. Um, so I'm going to share my short, fun recipe for making dandelion fritters. This is one that I made when I worked at Dodge Nature Center years ago. The kids loved it. It's pretty easy to make and uh, it ends up tasting like a state fair mini donut. Who doesn't like that? So I'm gonna go ahead and play a video that will kind of walk you through the steps of how Charlie and I made our dandelion fritters. The first thing we're gonna do, we got all of our dandelions. Mama had a baby and the head popped up. We pulled their heads off and now they're all in the colander and we're just gonna rinse them off in the cold water so that they're nice and clean. If there's any little bugs on there or scraps of dirt, we can get those off as well. And it's important when you're picking dandelions, if you're gonna eat them, that you should make sure to only pick them from a place you know they don't use chemicals because you don't wanna pick dandelions that might have an herbicide on them. So what we are doing right now is we are just making a super simple pancake recipe, milk and cooking oil book. And so Charlie is just really- Don't add anything to it. We need right now, we have a pan, which has of our pancake batter, and we get done. And um, just gonna, so we're gonna turn a little bit, and then this is the fun part. We take our and we just kinda drop. Demonstrating, he is gonna in one minute, and we'll see what they look like when they come out. Bunch of the fruiters, mm. using the slotted spoon, just to let a little bit of the oil fall out. And we got these delicious little. Okay. So we said many donuts. Um, of course, Charlie's favorite one that we had during all of our wild. Um, there are tons and tons of dandelion recipes you can find online. Uh, this Learning Herbs had a lot of, even had recipes for things that you could do with the stems that you could pickle the stems. I have yet to try it, but if you do it, Try it and um, report back to me. Okay, so there's plenty of wild edibles though that you can just snack on while you are out in nature that you don't necessarily know if they, you find them in them as well. Watercress, this was one that I for a long time, but I'd ever actually tried harvesting it myself. A yucca streams, it greens up. It's actually not native to North America. It's one people refer to it as a super funds of nutrients in it. So I'll just put of uh, the water crying in Western Wisconsin. So we are just, it's got these little that dangle down into the water. So it's really easy to just grab with us and brought it home. In cookbooks, so this wasn't even a wild edibles cookbook. This was a regular cookbook. And uh, put together a watercress and orange salad. So here is one of my uh, one of my lessons learned for the watercress. You have to wash it a ton. We found it growing in this really clean stream, and like I said, a lot of streams, you know, potentially might have E. coli that could have other contamination. So it's good to clean it a lot anyway. Um, but there was also tons of little snails in it, so we had to wash it so many times to make sure that it didn't have any snails left over, especially because we were going to be eating it for dinner, my husband's not quite as much of a nature guy as I am, and so wanted to make sure that there wouldn't end up being any escargot in our salad. Uh, but the salad tastes are really great, and so I would highly recommend trying this one. Uh, sumac. This is another one that's really easy to find growing of woods and fields. You might have heard about sumac being used as a spice. Um, that's usually a different variety that grows in the Middle East. The one that grows here in North America generally isn't used as a spice. It doesn't really honestly have very much nutritional value. Um, and I've got a video clip of us harvesting some at this time, but this is not actually the best time of year to harvest it. These are like the old berries that are left over from last summer. So really you want to go out more like end of June where there'll be bright red new berries 
and they'll have a lot better flavor to them. But um, forgive me, this one is a little bit blurry at the beginning. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things that grows in the edges of woods and fields is called sumac. I'm going to reach up, show you some of these berries close up. They're red, a little bit furry. You can't eat them outright, but you can. Yeah. Okay. They taste sour. Sour, yeah. So when I make sumac lemonade out of them, I always add a little bit of sugar. All right, so even though it's not the best time of year to harvest the sumac, we did pick some. And I took a few photos along the way of the steps you'd go through to make a sumac lemonade. When you get it home and you first uh, put it in, it will look like this big mess uh, with a lot of stems and dirt and other stuff that are stuck to the berries. So first you have to go through this kind of putty process of pulling all the little berries off. And then you smush up the berries a little bit and soak them in water for a while. And eventually you need to strain them so that you get the flavor and the juice from the berries with all, all of that dirt and the hairs that are on the outside of the berries and things like that. Um, if you read a recipe book, it will tell you to use cheesecloth. I'm not the kind of person who owns cheesecloth, but I do have cloth napkins. So I grabbed a red cloth napkin out of my cupboard and was able to use that to strain it came out with this nice looking red tea. It didn't really taste like that much, but I had a little bit of sugar and Charlie deemed it passable. So he said that that was a-okay. Um, let's see, I thought I saw a question coming in about sumac. Lauren, would you see if you could snag that question for me? Yep, uh, what, Jody asks, what type of sumac works better, smooth sumac or staghorn sumac, or does it not matter? I don't really think it matters. The only one to obviously be careful for would be the poison sumac, but it would be really, really unlikely to confuse that because it's got white berries, so it doesn't even look the same. Um, yeah, in terms of flavor, I don't know. I guess I've never done a taste comparison, but I think they'd both be fine. Okay, this one is pretty funny. Um, so Creeping Charlie, this is another one that people hate, myself included. Non-native grows aggressively in woodlands and shady lawns. It's in the mint family. And so it is one that you can eat as well. Uh, traditionally, it was used as a medicine and people actually even used it to brew beer in place of hops. And it is high in vitamin C. So I'll show you a short video of what we decided to do with our Creeping Charlie. And you can find out what my Charlie the Kid thought about it. Okay, so we are out for a rainy walk today, and we just discovered one of my least favorite yard weeds, Creeping Charlie, which happens to actually be edible, so we're going to pick some and bring it home. Okay, I have enlisted the help of a more qualified videographer this time, and we have the detestable Creeping Charlie that we found outside, and we are gonna to try to make it into just a very simple pesto that we can eat with crackers while we are playing a board game here in a moment, having some family board game time. Uh, and most pesto, same kind of oil. Usually salt just makes it put that all in there make it work make it work and then we're gonna make it work Boop, around the edges. and voila we have a pesto there we go okay creeping try the pesto here we go mm. really look like you like it <laughs> So that one didn't go over as well. That was not Charlie's favorite food. Also, I apologize for the dog, the cat, and the kid that you're probably hearing in the background. <laughs> Apparently, everybody in the family wants to be in on this wild edibles presentation. Okay, I'm going to keep trucking along here. I've got a couple more to share that we tried out and then a few that we didn't try out, but our recipes recommended from other people. 
cattails. This time of year is the perfect time of year if you are interested in trying to eat the cattail shoots when they are young. Um, actually, I'm just going to back up for one minute. Somebody was asking about the uh, asking about the creeping Charlie, which parts you could eat. In general, the little skinny parts of the stems and the leaves and the flowers are all good. I wouldn't eat the tough stems down at the bottom if it's been, you know, a really big branching kind of one um, and, you know, pull off all the roots and stuff down at the bottom. Um, so there is cattails growing all over the place in wetlands. Obviously, we've all seen them in different places. There's actually many parts of the cattail that are edible. You can eat the interior, like I was saying, of the stem at this time of year. A little bit later in the year when the new pods first start to emerge and they're green, you can take those and you can boil them. Those are edible. I've never actually tried doing that myself. Um, but there is, you might be surprised to know that there's actually a couple of different kinds of cattails that grow in Minnesota. So the broad leaf and the southern cattail are native to Minnesota. More commonly in our area, we're finding the narrow leaf cattail, which is actually a non-native, and it hybridizes really easily with the native variety to create another um, much more aggressive cattail. So even though there is a native variety in Minnesota, most of the times what you're finding in weapons around here is not native, I wouldn't feel that guilty about harvesting quite a bit of it to try out. And I let Charlie do the dirty work on this one. Charlie's got on his mucking boots and he is working on pulling out the green cattail shoots as they are growing up out of this wetland. We're gonna take the bottoms home. You can slice them up and they taste a little bit like cucumber. Is it easy or hard, Charlie? Very hard. So the other funny part that I'll tell you, Charlie was in there, he had the big boots on and I didn't, I was just wearing regular hiking boots. So I was like, hey, Charlie, why don't you go in and you can harvest um, as much of those cattails as you can. And he was having a great time. He was, I mean, honestly, he was in there for like an hour. I was getting bored. I'm just wandering around in circles, waiting for him to get done harvesting cattails. And he told me that five, five, not one, not two, not three, not four, but five snakes swam by while he was in there, but it didn't phase him a bit. He didn't care about that. Um, there's a question about cattails, if it's unsafe to eat, if any of the marsh is contaminated with fertilizer. Um, I wouldn't be so much worried about fertilizer as if, if there was some more like a pesticide, but, um, you know, fertilizer is just a nutrient. It means it's going to make the cattails grow more. It means there's going to be more algae in the water, but honestly, that's not going to affect whether or not it's safe to eat the cattail. Um, it's just like putting a lot of fertilizer in a farm field. The, the plants are still fine to eat. It just means that there's excess fertilizer washing off. So we are concerned about having excess fertilizer going into the wetlands because it does affect their natural health. Um, but in terms of whether you can eat a cattail or not, that's not going to really affect anything. Um, we stripped these down. So what we did was just cut off the bottoms. You can see here's our bag and um, stripped those home or brought those home and then stripped them down. And it's kind of fun. It's like you just keep peeling off layers and layers till you finally get to this part in the middle where it's soft enough and pliable enough that you can eat it. And my recommendation is like, these tasted good. They taste a little bit like cucumber. Um, they'd be better as a garnish than just having a big old bowl of them. We tried having a big old bowl of them for dinner on Sunday night and you kind of get sick of them after a few. Um, but with just a couple, it would be a nice garnish on top of the salad. Um, there's a couple questions about the creeping Charlie pesto and the garlic and also garlic mustard pesto as an alternative. I thought the creeping Charlie pesto was fine. It is a really strong flavor. The creeping Charlie it smells great, but it's uh, really bitter. So it's a, it's a very strong pesto. So Charlie didn't like it. My husband was kind of in it. I thought it was fine with a cracker. Um, I have made the garlic mustard pesto before and that's a lot milder flavor so that's probably a, a better one to try if you don't like that stronger more bitter flavor. Um, just a couple of other recipes and recommendations. Um, one is nettles. This is one that a lot of times people will even get them in community farm shares. Uh, there are some farms that are just you know bagging them up and sending them to their customers. 
there's two kinds of nettles that grow in Minnesota. And you can have the stinging nettle, which is a non-native one. The wood nettle has a little bit rounder leaves and is native, but they both sting. So you will never forget a nettle. If you've never encountered one, you're lucky, um, but you will never forget a nettle once you've touched one for the first time. You touch them and they've got these stinging hairs that just make your skin burn like crazy. However, amazingly enough, you can boil them and they're fine to eat once you've been able to destroy that stinging reaction. And they're really high in nutrients. They kind of end up tasting a little bit like spinach. So we harvested some over the weekend to make into a soup, which is a recommended recipe for one of my coworkers. I'll just play you us harvesting. I am here in the floodplain forest when you're in wet woods, that is the best place to find stinging nettle. Sorry, while I pause, I thought there was perhaps a snake in the dry leaves behind me. Um, and I'm going to be picking some nettle to make nettle soup. And I'm using a Ziploc bag over my hand because the nettle will sting your hands when you touch it. But once we cook it, just for a couple of minutes, that will kill those stinging needles. And so then we'll be able to eat it without it stinging our mouths. All right, there we go. You can stop it now. A couple of times from Tara. Hopefully that wait for one video again. I'm not sure why all of a sudden another stream popped up. Um, so this was a recipe from my coworker, Tara. And she said, it tastes like grazing in a fresh green field in the best possible way, which I found intriguing enough that I had to try it out. So it was a recipe that uses the nettle tops along with potatoes and some spices. And uh, we put this together. It tasted really good. It's a very good soup. Um, the only thing was we used like two gallon Ziploc bags of nettles and it still really wasn't actually enough. By the time we picked all of the leaves off of the nettles and then as soon as you boil them, you know, you have like this much nettle and then it suddenly becomes like a cup of nettle and the recipe actually called for more like three to four cups. So it ended up being a very nice green. It looked exactly like in the picture, uh, but it didn't have a super strong flavor. Another recipe recommendation from a colleague at Washington Conservation District is the Wild Ranch Buttermilk Biscuits. I have not had a chance to try this one out yet, but I don't really see how you could possibly go wrong with buttermilk biscuits. So I assume that this will be a good one as well. I'm just gonna share just a couple of more things that you can try eating, ones that um, I don't necessarily have a recipe or a demonstration for, but are ones that you can find either this month or in the next month. Um, Virginia water leaf, I'm going, if you're looking at the pictures, I'm going from left to right. So Virginia water leaf, you can pick the young leaves and put them on salads. Violets are blooming right now. The blossoms are beautiful. They're full of vitamin C. You can put on the top of a salad. Um, you can do some other kinds of things, infuse them into a tea. Milkweed, um, collecting the tops while they're in bud, including the top five leaves and cook until tender. Um, I have a really funny story about the milkweed. So a lot of you may know that milkweed is also the preferred plant for the monarch caterpillar. And the reason is that it's got a natural toxin in the plant. So other, other plants aren't able to eat it other than the, or other insects aren't able to eat it other than the monarch caterpillars. Um, so if you are cooking milkweed to eat as a human, I've always read that you have to boil it in several changes of water. And several years ago, I was teaching a wild edibles class and decided I was gonna try doing milkweed with the group. And we boiled in you know, three or four different changes of water and we all agreed that milkweed tasted really good. It was just kind of like having spinach. And the next morning I woke up and um, I'll use the chat feature. Does anybody know what happens when you've had beets for dinner the day before? Like a lot of beets for dinner the day before? So I woke up in the morning and I go to the bathroom and I'm like, oh my God, there's blood in my stool, there's blood in my urine. I've poisoned my entire class. And I was freaking out for about half an hour until I finally remembered that I had had beets for lunch and dinner the day before. So it was just the beets. It wasn't, it wasn't milkweed, the milkweed safe to eat. Um, this is the recipe there for the garlic mustard that Lauren was mentioning earlier. A couple other recipes. Um, Stuffed grape leaves, 
The grape leaves are not um, quite out yet, but keep an eye out for them. Um, the plantain, it can be eaten. Um, I find it extremely bitter. The, the funny advice that I've always heard is eat the leaves when they're the size of a mouse's ear. Well, I don't know. I mean, a mouse's ear is really pretty small. So I think they're really pretty bitter unless you get them when they're very, very tiny. Uh, Jerusalem artichoke is one that we would eat during the fall. It can be eaten raw or cooked. Um, and chicory is one that you can grind up the root and brew it kind of like coffee. Uh, so I have a question. Can you eat these things like the Creeping Charlie and the cattails during all times of the year? And um, usually there are certain times of the year when you can eat certain parts of the plant and not others. So for example, the cattails, you can eat the shoots at this time of the year. Once you get a little later into the summer, you can't eat the shoots anymore. They get to be too tough. And the same thing with the flower heads, you can eat the, um, those buds, you know, the sausage like part when they're green, when they first emerge. But once they become brown, you can't eat them anymore. Then it's just going to be a bunch of fluff in your mouth. Um, so I think that if you're a beginning wild edibles forager, you should definitely focus on things that you for sure know you can identify. And, um, you know, as you learn to positively identify things more with a little bit more confidence, you can venture into other plants. If it's something you're just not sure, if you're looking at it and you're like, I think it might be a plant, I think it might not, just don't eat it. It's better to be safe. Um, some resources to learn more. The go-to guide that I use most often is the Peterson Field Guides of Edible Wild Plants. And this is your typical field guide that has lots of really good diagrams of what the plants look like. And it doesn't have recipes in it, but it will tell you what parts of the plant are edible and at what times of the year. And you can see mine is just all marked up with the pages of the things that I've tried over time. So this is a really good one to use when you're learning how to identify plants and finding out if you, if you find something and you're like, I know what this is and I don't know if it's edible or not, this is a good guide to look at. This one is one that I collected years ago. I don't even know when I got a hold of it, but it is actually a collection of recipes and it's submitted from people all over Minnesota by the Friends of the Tamarack National Wildlife Refuge. It's divided into chapters. So there's a whole section that's all about edible plants, one that's about jams and jellies. And then there's a whole section about the other kinds of wild edibles, like the animals that you can eat. Um, my favorite, I can't look at it without laughing, Beaver Delight. My, my son and I sometimes look through this cookbook just, just to read the titles of the different recipes that are in there. There's snake soup. There's all sorts of things because all sorts of animals are also edible, but I don't uh, generally eat those wild edibles. I look at the plant section of the Nature's Edible Bounty book. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my screen now and go back to, I'll, I'll just talk ever so slowly so that you can write down my content, contact information if you need it. But I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the presentation now so that you can see me. And I can see some of these questions as they're coming in on chat, but if you wanna unmute yourself to ask a question, we're just about up on 115, so you can feel free to do that. Um, and then I can wave and say hi to the to the few of you that were hanging out there that I couldn't see your video videos during the presentation. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> okay, um, are there any other questions that I didn't hit on while I was talking? Okay, like I said, I will be sure to post this presentation on the Washington Conservation District website. And I will send out an email with this and other resources to everyone after the presentation. Okay, guys? Anybody have any wild edible recipes that you've tried that you want to share with us while you've got our attention? Any fun things? Angie, it's Anna B checking in. You hey, might Anna. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of the berries on our beautiful trees right now service berries might be out real soon and get them before the robins do but you might want to just take a little time and and talk about all of the wild edible berries 
high bush cranberries, the ones that are around the meeting house at, at Wilder Forest, you might want to check into um, any, any kind of shrubby berries. Thanks. Shrubby berries, yeah. That, that is really good advice. There's a ton of those. Um, and there's also a few that you should definitely avoid. Uh, buckthorn is the first one that comes to mind. Buckthorn's got those dark purple berries. Do not eat those. Those will give you diarrhea. So don't have those. Um, and, uh, oh, it's right in the tip of my tongue. Um, Virginia creeper, that's another one that's got poisonous berries. So don't eat those. But yeah, there, there's a lot of those, the, the service berry, the, um, the wild plum, the wild cherries, a lot of those kind of trees that are going to be getting berries. I also have some wild roses that are growing in my front yard and they get those really cool, um, they call them rose hips afterwards and you can soak those and use those for a tea. So those are kind of fun also. I'm seeing some good, oh, huckleberries, yum. Yeah, there's a lot of good ones. A ramp pesto, nettle pasta, ramp butter. These are awesome. I wish that we could all see each other in person. Somebody was telling me that her dad used to have wild edible potluck parties and everybody came and brought a different dish that they had made and they would all um, have a big meal together and that would be so fun to do. So we're gonna have to do that someday when we're all able to see each other in person again. Okay, um, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon and Hopefully you're a little bit inspired and you might go out and try some new things or go out and harvest some dandelions this afternoon and make dandelion fritters for dessert tonight. And thank you for joining me. I'm going to go ahead and log off now. Bye everyone.